Welcome to quick and easy Halloween projects. Um, every now and again it's just fun to take a departure from your day-to-day -day, um, base coat shade, highlight, and do all that kind of stuff. And it's kind of fun just to make a painted project that would be completed quickly and it doesn't have to be like an investment of your life. Um, we've got some new um, apothecary labels. I've used this one, sorry about that. They come in a bunch of different sizes. And one paper, if you wanted to do them all the same, would be big enough to do these apothecary jars, this necklace, um, this giant um, apothecary jar label. So you can cut out various sizes, you could frame them, you can do whatever you want. There's a, just a whole bunch of choices. And then we've got um, some background papers, which I'm looking for and don't see, that are awesome for any kind of art that you want to put on top. And I just stenciled um, a crow and some Nevermore words and birdcage and did some magical stuff. The most exciting thing, and if you're not even into Halloween and you don't even whatever, is that I have discovered through this video the use for these new media paints. These are pure pigment. They don't base coat at all. But to make the, the jar look like it's kind of a little luminescent, I've used the media paints to glaze over. And I'm able to glaze over my, um, my label um, without, base, without anything showing or anything covering up the ink. So I'm able to paint on top of something that's already inked and it doesn't cover anything up. So I can paint over my, my highlights and it won't cover my highlights so it won't base coat it. There's no fillers in these and, at all. And then interference medium is a iridescent kind of medium that shows up really well on dark things. And I show you all about how to use these in this video. So, and we've also got some really cool stuff. We've got black modeling paste and white modeling paste that I've mixed with paint to give that like a textured cork look. This is packed with all kinds of information. You're going to learn something new, I promise. Um, enjoy the video. Okay, so introducing some of our brand new papers. These are apothecary labels, and then these are like an Edgar Allan Poe inspired paper. So this has got actually a little bit of the, the raven, um, and this is Quote the Raven. We've got candelabras and gears and steampunk and Victorian and, and gothic and everything going on here. These papers are available in colors. And these labels we've made into various and sundry sizes. We've got octopus ink, raven feathers, spider silk, mermaid tears. We decided to do these goblin grease, not so spooky and like, you know, Eye of Newton, that kind of thing. We decided to go a little bit more genteel with them, a little bit more fun, a little bit more family friendly. And one of the things that we did with these papers is we made them into papers that um, can be grisaille painted. So these are all done in the gray. And so what is really cool about them is you can take your transparent colors and you can glaze with just a little bit of transparent um, different colors. And on the crow I would um, maybe beef up his blackness with a little glaze of black and then put a little teeny bit of like maybe desert turquoise or something like that. So, um, and then you could bring some color down into the lettering and stuff. I think the um, mermaid tears would be fantastic with some teal and aquas worked into this. Um, if you're into pinks, it could be all pinks and stuff. So you could really have fun with these. You can just decoupage them on, and then you can just paint and grisaille or glaze over the tops. So, and then, oh, we've had so much fun. So and then these ones are available in colors, and we were trying to think of what else you would do. Well. What inspired the whole thing was these um, little apothecary jars that you fill with treats. And, you know, we wanted labels to put on here, and we wanted them to be readily available in good sizes. So, you know, like for example, and oh, I've got some cut out over here. They kind of look like playing cards. And we've made one of them the size of a playing card so that you can um, do like an artist trading card kind of situation. So then you just cut them out and then you can just glaze them onto your bottle. Okay, so that's kind of the thought behind um, behind how this got started. Well, now we've also got a beautiful, um, what well, a nice wood-shaped um, apothecary jar. So one of these kinds of jar that's wood, and then you can put your labels on there. You could also, these are made into sizes that you could frame this and put it in as like an entryway kind of thing if you wanted to, to go that direction. But it even goes even further. 
um, like it's kind of like sky's the limit, you know, and you could take, um, I've got, I like these little Altoid Smalls because they fit in my purse and they're kind of tasty. So, but I've got the little empty container. Well, the little empty container would be fantastic for all kinds of odds and ends. So you could take spider silk and just decoupage on the words on there, or you could just go with the art. Like there's a lot of ways that you can kind of subdivide the papers up. So you don't have to just use them, you know, one way. All right, and then we had some fun. Let me get this over here. These are bezels, and I don't sell the charms. We don't offer those. We do carry these these little um, bits here that you can make into jewelry. And so what we did with this is we cut a portion out where it says the raven or whatever here, and we just put that paper in there. You drop that bezel um, right on in, and you. Um, and then you have a necklace that you can embellish with other charms. And there's round ones and square ones and octagon ones and stuff like that. So what a lovely necklace that you could do. Now what you could also do is you could put a little crow in there, a little crow feather. You could have a painting moment, but even better, if you want to get into your lovely Halloween kind of, we thought the mermaid tears was just amazing for a jewelry piece especially, that we've made just take that out. I made this so that you could actually just pop in that little mermaid tears um, one. You would just trace the outline on there. The outline you trace from the outside of this um, stone. Trace it, cut it out, drop it in there, and you can change them, which is kind of cool. Um, well, I guess you might not be able to change them if you glue it in. But um, but the neat thing is you can make your own custom little necklace, and you can take your you know small floating brush put some of your color splashes in there, um, put a couple of extra little things, some little bits of shell in your jar, um, you tell a whole story that way. So these are designed to actually be, you know, multi-craft kind of things. And so, you know, these papers aren't limited to now you've got jewelry, now you've got, you know, little labels for things. And then we had a lot of fun because then we took that same wood jar, which I forgot to bring a little one, and we made it into the most ginormous jar in the, on the planet. Okay, and here's our jar. And we thought this would be fantastic putting it on your front porch. Okay, so now you've got this is painted like an apothecary jar and it's got a lovely cork. And then you take and you tie your raffia and your little bottles and your keys and things like that and it's hanging there. Then we thought you could screw three of these together, make them into kind of haunted um, potions um, fireplace screen for the fall um, or just a triptych on your porch that would be wonderful as well and then we went someplace even scarier so welcome to our lovely journey this is how this all comes comes together so the next thing we thought is that this looks like a giant tombstone and that looks like a cross so that this could be really cool to put on your front porch with you know just fake tombstone writing and stuff like that not just a bottle but then we had painted this little spooky hollow project and my hinges are not attached right now because we had to take them apart to trace. But so this little gate closes over the top of this and once we went tombstone with the bottle then it was like well let's have these tombstones be big. This one's just a paper mache tombstone right here. So but he stands up and then when the gates are open you can see the whole scene and it just looks lovely. Then Long story, a lot of fun, a lot of things. Okay, so this is the giant size, um, the giant size tombstone or apothecary jar, except for we've reshaped it as a tombstone. And then you can, whoops, you can make a loud noise. You can put your hinges on and then you have the giant triptych for your front porch for Halloween. And we've got the, we've redone the gates so that they fit all the different tombstone shapes and you could have different ones. But a scene painted on this, on your front porch, wonderful. Okay, so I'm going to show you a couple of quick and easy projects that you can make using some pretty affordable surfaces. You can take some canning jars or apothecary jars. You can do your um, paper mache tombstone, I think it's like five, five bucks. Um, the little jewelry findings. Um, the apothecary bottle, that kind of stuff. So um, I'm just going to kind of go through a couple of projects. We'll just combine them all together, and that way you can, you know, like sometimes I, I get the feeling that I wouldn't want 
to spend you know five, six, seven, eight, ten days of my painting time in um, on one little tombstone project because it's not something that I would have out all the time. So I want things that are kind of quick and easy. Okay, so we're going to take our little paper mache tombstone. And what I love about these tombstones is I was kind of banging um, a tombstone against my hand. Don't ask me why. Um, and I could feel that they've actually put, almost like Ikea furniture, where they put a little bit of like something hard in between. And I haven't had any problem with these things caving in. So it's like really quality, super strong um, paper mache. I was really tickled with that. Okay, so we're going to always, with paper mache, use multi-purpose sealer first. I'm going to use my mushroom sponge applicator to make applying it really fast. Nothing about these projects is going to be long except for, maybe on this case, the drying time. So if you work on a couple of things, then it won't be bad. The way you wash out your, your um, mushroom sponge is you just go squish it under water. And I like to use nitrile glove on my hand because I don't like all that stuff on my hands. So I'll just use my nitrile glove and squish it out and let it dry. Okay, what you'll notice when you do paper mache, and the reason you want to seal it is every now and again you'll get a couple of little blisters. And then that's just when it's wet. And then this stuff is like super duper. This is what you use for outdoor stuff. So this is going to make sure this is like liquid tight or not able to have liquid penetrate. So you'll just blow dry and then everybody will settle down and then you can paint as usual without any um, bubbling. One of the things that I do a lot with the, the mushroom sponge is I leave it out just a little bit too long and it starts drying at the edges. I think this stays wet down here and then this does not. So what I do is I just go in with my scissors and I give it a little haircut and take the hardened stuff off and then I repurpose it and continue using it. So if you get some dried, don't worry about it, Just it's not going to look as pretty, but you can just trim off those edges. All right, we're going to take our um, surface here, and we're going to use our big old giant four-inch decoupage brush. Put on an even coat, brushing away to our edges. You don't want it puddly, but you don't want it dry. And I'm working with this nonstick mat, which means all this glue type stuff will just clean up like a dream when I get done. And we want to be careful of our edges drying quicker than everything else because the paint or the medium will dry from the outside in. Okay, then I'm going to make sure we're not putting it in a wet spot. Put some, let's see, I think I want this lower corner is what I want. Put your medium on the back of your paper. Having the big brush lets you work really fast. Yeah. It's hard to do this gracefully. I apologize for my goofiness. And then we go on here. And did I get the right corner? I didn't get the right corner. I'm going to have to refresh on my... Um, when you flip the paper over, you've got to do the opposite side. Okay. So now, you lay your paper down. Pick it back up. I kind of want this uh, bottom little corner right here. Okay. Dry your hands off because you don't want any of this on the top. Kind of give it a little pinch around the edge. Make sure that you get into some of those little bent areas on the on the um, the box. Okay, I'm going to take my little rayer. I've got a little kind of concave little cap here. You can find whatever works. The back of a spoon. And I'm just going to get that really nice and flat, no bubbles. And then I'll 
and let it just sit off on a table and let it dry. All right, so my paper is dry. I left it dry overnight. And I've got to tell you, that is as smooth a uh, decoupage as I've ever seen, actually. That worked out really well, and it's on paper mache. So now we're going to flip it over, and then we're going to take our little uh, retractable knife, and we're just going to score around the edges. And I'm going to take this out to my nonstick. My um, cutting mat is a little bit lumpy. I used it to blow dry on, and the heat from the blow dryer uh, made it be yucky. Anyway, so I'm going to take this out to the other side, but I'm just going to score along, score along around the whole edges. Okay, and as I'm reading my directions, I believe what it's saying is that I was supposed to have put my, um, my additional coats of stuff over the top, and I'm using the mat so that I can paint over this, um, but I didn't, and I really am liking how this turned out. So it says for smoother coat to put a little bit of water in your brush. So I'm going to, I think that'll make the glue just a little bit thinner. I'm going to brush from the middle out. I don't want to make it saturated, saturated, but I, just a little bit of thinner glue, I think, and get rid of that little schmutzy thing. Okay, so I want to go out to my edge, and I want to make sure I'm rounding over that edge because the paper leaves a couple little fray bits. And I didn't get enough out. But notice that I'm not just like glomming it on there. I think that that's also a good idea. Super not a fan of these open mouth jars. Love this brush though. If you want to do quick work easily, this is the brush to get. have to patch a little bit of my paint. I kind of nipped into it when I was cutting. Okay, now just give it a nice brush over. All right, and now I'm going to dry. Okay, so if you have any little loose little scrappy edges, you're going to take a sanding disc with the roughest grit and you'll just sand that little edge. It's a really good way to get that kind of formed little edge. And if you wanted to distress this a little bit more, you could sand like right on your paper too. So don't be afraid to do that. Okay, I've got my papers. I've got a couple sample papers. And I've got the Deco Art Media Fluid Acrylics. Now, let me explain what these are because I did not understand it when I was looking at them online and stuff like that. Okay, so what these are, these are paints without fillers, which means that they're not going to muddy up. Okay, so you can glaze over things without it base coating over the thing that's underneath it. And so for example, I've got this little sample of my Nevermore project. This is the silver interference, and you can see that you can still read all the words. It's just got a sheen to it. This is over black. This is the purple interference, and then this is the green interference. And so it doesn't cover it up. It just kind of glazes, and the inter interference one has that iridescence to it. And then over here, if you take your, I used the fluid media and I just slip slapped it. Nope, that was interference. I used the violet interference and I just slip slapped it over this whole area, but notice that it only picked up and read really purple on the black. So where things are dark, the, the interference colors are going to be very strong and where the things are light, they're not going to show at all. But I think the thing, oh, and this is the purple color. And you can see that this is dioxazine purple, and when you look at it on the palette, I mean, that almost looks black. I mean, that is pure, pure, pure pigment. That is glorious color. Okay, so, but when you thin it out with some water and you just kind of slip slop on the background, then you have this really sheer looking um, color. Oh, and I, I mixed the gray with the, the interference gray, and that's what's really cool too. I'm sorry, I'm all over the place because I'm just having so much fun with them. If I take my gray and I just do that over the piece, then I'm adding some kind of distressing and some antiquing, but I'm not base coating. You can't, you're not gonna base coat with these, but you are gonna glaze and you are gonna take some work out of things. So then I moved over to Mermaid. And actually, let me show you one right from the beginning. 
All right, so I've got my, um, let me scooch things around. So if I wanted to tint my letters on the mermaid into a, maybe a little bit more teal kind of situation, and you can mix these. So I'm gonna mix my um, interference blue and my interference green together. You do have to shake the interference colors. Okay, and then I'll get my green going. And you can see that it dries on the palette um, in the color that it's going to do. And you can float these in colors. It's really cool. Let me start playing. The problem that I had is I just didn't quite understand from the multimedia. I don't come from that world, so I didn't quite understand how it would translate into my world of regular, you know, craft or tool painting. So maybe I want some um, some turquoisey kind of tints to things. So I'm going to go up here on here, and I'm just going to add a little bit. I think I've got too much blue. Add just a little bit of that kind of turquoise in that area. Now watch, I'll just slip slap over that area so I don't even have to be careful. Is that my blue? No, I've lost which one's my blue. I'll just make a color. So I can just go over it and I'm going to get just a tint of color in these areas. But now if I wanted those, say I wanted it a little bit stronger, I can go into that color, a little bit, teeny bit of the blue. And I can, I can kind of strengthen my interference color. And I can just put that in. Then I'm going to get a little bit of that glazing in the background. Can you see? It's really subtle, but I think that's the thing that's so amazing. So we've got this distressing and antiquing over here. You can, whoops, too much. Go into a little bit more medium. You can just come over here and add that touch that you need in that area. Come on down here and maybe we want to balance that out with some of that color on her. And I'm not being careful, I'm just kind of adding some glazes of color where I want them. If I want to tone that color down, I'll just go on my palette and rob just a little bit of my gray. And now that'll be less vibrant. Okay, so it's just a little bit lower down the scale. Um, so then I've got that going on, so maybe I want her hair. I'm gonna have to rinse that brush. And I've got gold and my yellow. Just a hair of the yellow, because it's, it's so strong. That's what I'm loving about this. Okay, so we're gonna go into her hair, and I'm just gonna pick on a little bit. And so this is like using the, the, the artwork to make you know, it's color book, but marker, but paint, but whatever. Okay, so see how easy it is to add just that little bit of tone, a little bit of tone color there, and just add the little hints. And, you know, here I went crazy with all the colors because I just was playing. Um, but here's the thing I want to share. Okay, is when I feel this, I mean, I don't know if you can listen. It's the same. There's not, you know how when you put paint on paper, it always feels really rough. This doesn't have any change in feeling at all, but yet it's not rubbing off. Um, it's not making my paper buckle. It's not, I'm just using so little because it's so pure and it's just tinting. I don't need to, to use or alter anything. And then I took it a step further and I brought out my easy elegant grapes that I did with stencils. So I did, the whole grape project was just layering and watch what you can do, and I'm going to wipe it off because I don't want to change it because then my instructions won't match my sample. I can take just a tint of this red if I wanted it to be redder, and I can glaze right over my painting and see what it does to that. So I can just say, okay, yeah, I want that to be a little bit more and this to be a little bit more. Okay, I'll wipe that off. And this is all water soluble too. Maybe I want to go into my leaf, and maybe my leaf needs to have just a little bit of red in it. Stay out of my background. Okay, I could totally just glaze some red onto my leaf. Then let's get a little bit crazier and say, what if we want to bring just a little bit of maybe that toned kind of red? Mixing it with gray. I don't want it to scream at me too loud. And I could bring some of that in my background, in my shading areas, and I could carry my colors around. See how easy that is just to scumble around. 
Okay, so I'll wipe that off. This, in my opinion, is really kind of a game changer. I think this just makes this be a tool in your arsenal to use with your acrylic paints, and it just goes with the same varnish and everything. Um, I think you're going to love it. Okay, I'm positioning my crow, and I used him on my little sample paper. And so then I tried to clean him without using a like a flat bottom sink, and I kind of jerked around on my stencil there. It's a little bit wonky, so I think this will be okay. So I'm going to use the jumbo applicator. Always wash your stencils, by the way, on the flat bottom of your sink, gently rubbing with like a, a sponge or something. And so then we'll just go in and we'll make him a black crow. And then we're going to use those interference media, um, yeah, the interference paints. And I've got to say, I think my analogy for those interference and for those media paints is that they're the soul that um, that craft paints have been missing. Um, when we look at traditions paints, um, everybody loves them for their vibrancy. So now you can have your craft paint that covers and base coats and you don't have to mix it, but you can glaze with the vibrancy of a pure pigment. And I think that that is gonna be all the difference. It's just a really neat, neat, neat thing. Get nice and base coated. And take off your stencil and we're gonna to need to play with him and um, the nevermore word before we put on the cage because I think we're gonna texture the cage. Okay, when we get ready to do our lettering, what we're going to do with the lettering is make sure that we're straight, always. And I'm gonna to switch to a dome brush because this gets into more of the detail area and it controls the paint. You can always blot it off too. I was teaching one of my, um, one of our employees how to um, stencil something and she learned really well, but she really paid attention to the part where I blot it on the paper towel a little bit before I go. I don't go from here to here. I tend to go off on my paper towel first. Loose hair. Okay. So, load again. It's better to do a couple thin coats, and she's got it where she doesn't have any bleed under or any, any little yucky things. So, um... I was commending her and I thought that would be something that I could share with you guys. So just go ahead and get that a nice base and by the time you move across you'll probably be ready to do a number two coat if you feel like you need it. Alright, I think the thing that you're going to see too is because they're so pure and you're not trying to base coat, these little bottles are going to last you a really long time because you just need a little drop of stuff. So I want to antique my edges just a little bit more than they are with the gray. So I'm going to get over there and just antique them. Pull some of that in in my cobwebby corners. Okay. It's almost like this makes you the graphic designer to finish the paper the way you want it to fit your piece. Gives you kind of choices. It's sheer and uh, all the cool things. Okay, so we'll get down here in the bottom. Just kind of just anchor that down. Don't leave a line. And because you're not floating and you're just glazing, it just makes it super easy. And you can layer them, which is even super cooler. Okay, so I'm just going to bring that across. I want this area to stay brighter. Okay, so I'll wash that out. And I think, I think I'm liking the purple at the bottom. So we're gonna get purple. It's violet interference medium. And that was the dark gray value three. So that's what you're gonna use if you have these pure pigments and you want it a little bit darker. You'd mix a little bit. You could go across your color wheel and do a little color theory, or you could mix a little dark gray in your paints. So we're going to go ahead and float across the bottom. So it's kind of a float. It could just glaze. I, you don't really need water. Okay, and so then we're going to go over here in the corner. Just anchor that down. Yeah, I'm just kind of slip slapping across. And get that base kind of purple looking.
then we'll reach the arm of that purple up. Okay, so bring that kind of climbing up. Can you see it? You're going to be able to see it when we get the picture. This is probably a reflection kind of thing. I'm going to go up here. I'm going to add some of that in the background. And on our crow, we're going to add some to his belly. Maybe a little bit to his branch. And then I think I like that little bit of um, turquoise iridescence in there as well. So pick up some of that and bring it along his back feather. And I think we'll bring it across the top of the Nevermore. And then carry that color in. Okay, and then you take a look and see what you got. Now, to make it be more, or rather, less subtle, let's go into Thalo Green. And see, I'm just going to take out just that microscopic drop because there's no way I want phthalo green screaming across my project. I'm going to mix it with the gray and then mix it with interference. Now this is going to be more strong, so I'm going to want to be really careful with this one. Okay, so I think we'll bring this up side. See how that's showing on the gray paper? here in the corner. Okay, so we want to definitely make sure we're mixed. The neat thing is is that you have the control to take that color down versus having, you know, this is my zinc color and I can't do anything other than make it be zinc or mix it muddy with things. You you get that option. Okay, so this is looking really good. This is probably more than anything a multimedia project which is just fine. Kind of want it cobwebby looking and one color sneaking into the other. So then we can do the same thing with the purple. Oops. So we'll go into purple. Just our little dot. So do you notice that I used just a little corner of that and I still have my whole pile left. You don't need hardly any of the color. Okay, purple's the same way. Look how bright that is. So I tone it down with some gray and then get into my interference medium. Got a little bit of water in my brush as well. And let's bring up some purple in our candlestick. starting to see kind of a little fadey color. I can bring it. I don't want this just to become like a purple project. I, think I need a little bit more of my teal color in my bird. I want to try adding a little bit of dreamy mistiness. I'm going to start with my slate gray. I think I'm going to come, that's probably not going to cover. Yeah, well that might mute out some of the writing which will make it appear dreamy. And I'm going to go behind my candlestick and in front over here, kind of trickle down and around. And then I want to bring it up and around through my word. So now we're going to love that we have a little bit of the um, opaqueness. So the regular acrylic paints will give us the opaqueness and then the media paints will give us the sheer transparent and then we have the best of both worlds and we can just put our puzzle together any way we want. So here we go now with white. I'm going behind the candlestick.
to just be that dreamy misty. Look at that, it's fading in the word. Okay, now we need to get it whiter. really kind of haunted and kind of eerie. Yeah, maybe we need to go in front of that candelabra. Yeah. Okay. And we'll just bring up the white a little bit more. So you could pick and choose what to do. I mean, you honestly could put the, the crow on the paper and, and do the birdcage and whatever and just be like, yay, I'm done. It's just decoupaged on. Okay, and now we need the spatter. So we'll get out our White Wonder rake. And it's a really long, kind of floppy little rake. And that is going to make our spatters be um, fall off where we want them to. You always test off place where your project isn't or your neighbor's project. You don't want either of those things happening. Okay, so I want it off of my candlesticks. And I also want it off my crow. I want my crow to be black. So I'll turn my brush. Okay, this brush is not heavy handled enough. You need a heavy handle to be able to get the paint to kind of cooperate. Okay, so yeah, that's going to be nice and dreamy. I think let's go in with a little bit of black at our outer edges. Heavier, um, the thinner your paint, the bigger your spatters will be. Just give that a nice, kind of eerie kind of. This would be a fantastic. Um, project for like a um, one of your chapter meetings or something like that because it's just so different but it would be so easy to get done all at the same time people could play with the colors you know that'd be great so I'm going to take a little bit of my um, thalo and I'm going to add just a little sparkle of somethingness in the background We made gates that fit all of these tombstone styles, and then we made different sizes of all the tombstones. But this might make a lovely, have the hinges on there, might make a lovely triptych. But I don't know how it would look if I put a bird cage on it and the thing. So I don't think that'd be good together, but I think alone, I think this is just lovely. So it might be a, a really neat way. You put a little candle in front or something, a nice little vignette kind of maker. Love these gates. Okay, I think it's time. I think I'm there. It's time to apply the cage. So the cage comes out of the letters. We're going to center it. I'm going to make sure that we center it in the piece and at the top of the letters. Make sure we're straight. And then I'm going to tape my um, bottom here so that um, when I put the medium over it, it won't um, shift around. Okay, we have a couple new toys to play with here. We've got our extra big rounded edge um, palette knife, 
and we've got the black tinted modeling paste so we don't have to do any of the work okay so what we're going to do is I want this to be textured so what we're going to do is just I'm gonna get a little bit less of that on there we don't need so much and then we're just going to go and fill in the areas holding your stencil down oops don't let it move and then when you pick it up if you've let it move like I just did you're going to want to be careful to um, clean up any bleed under because it'll still be nice and wet you want it real thick. I'm leaving mine on kind of thick so it's going to be kind of raised. It can be rough. Go down the long lines because otherwise you won't get a clean line. And to answer the question, Yes, I'm learning these things as I'm going along. So I'm just sharing my observations with you as I'm painting, which is what I always do. And then if I make a mistake, I show you how I fix it. That's why we leave all these little flubs in here. I love how rich and dark this is. Okay. And we peel up and take my tape off. Peel straight up and look at how awesome that looks. That's really, really cool. Now we're going to do one more thing. I'm going to find a place to put this. Okay, so yeah, that's just dreamy and wonderful. And then we're going to go into just a touch and I'm going to put it on my palette. It's a warm color, so I'm going to want to be just stamped with it. Just going to put a touch of what color is it? It is mahogany ultra fine glitter. Kind of thinking rusty metal here. It's just a little bit of warmth. Okay, that is so stinking cool. I love it. Okay, so I'm back to my gates just to see how they look. And you know, I don't think they look that bad. It's pretty cool looking. Just kind of frames it. Love these. Two. Okay, so I've brushed off my um, excess glitter with a mop brush, and you could easily add just little scumbles of some um, a clear glitter, some like sparkly, just shiny stuff, and that would be really pretty in there, I think, as well. Um, I love how this is kind of understated but kind of eerie and creepy, and it just fits that Poe esque. It's a more elegant kind of masquerade Halloween versus a icky, you know haunted kind of thing. This is just insinuates a lot of attitude. And I think, oh, I've got one more thing I want to add. At least I think I want to add it. Am I dry? I think I'm dry. I kind of want to have a little bit of metal on here. So I'm thinking that I'll add a key and a keyhole and then just kind of glue, whoops, hi, glue that there and hang some other keys on it. Okay, I'm going to use my drill, or my hole, and that will just poke a hole in there. Okay, I'm going to move this so I can just keep drilling comfortably. 
and then I'm going to glue my key into this hole. Whoops. There it goes. Let's see if that fits in there. Not quite. So we use the bigger end and kind of make it a little bit bigger. Definitely want it to be tight. Okay, so keyholes first, and I think we need to add just a little bit of black paint. We'll add some of this muck here, right where the keyhole is going to go, so that you don't see blue behind the keyhole, because that should definitely be dark. Okay, so I'm going to put a glob of glue on here, put a glob in my hole, and move quickly. that on the glue, get it straight, and then get that key in that hole before everything dries. Okay, so I'm going to mix a little teeny bit of black in with the dark gray. I want a little bit more opacity for my antiquing. Got to be careful though, that means I'm floating, so I want to be really cautious that I don't think I'm glazing, because glazing we can be careless Loading, we can't. Okay, I want this just to be a little bit more strongly colored at the edges. Without just being outlined. Okay, I think that's a little bit better. Maybe just a little bit more. You get back and squint. See if that helps you figure stuff out. It usually does me. That went behind. Let's darken that back up. brings the candlestick forward. Just a fun little project. I'm going in with a little teeny bit more of the purple and the violet interference medium. Just a little bit more in the corners. Black areas. go on the cage. Oh, I didn't even think about that. The cage is going to pick that up so nicely. Okay, be careful if you're going to go on the cage and you don't want to touch or worry about the other areas not to use the purple, because that's what I just did and I was glazing. little bit of sparkle from the and warmth. I think that's just a really fun. Go back into the gray black. Deepen just a little bit more. Okay, I think I want just a little bit stronger um, trail of pretty stuff. So we're just going to make some little little sparkles. Give it a nice strong walking trail. And then I'll kind of bring that magic into our scene. See how that's going. And so you could stop at any point 
If you keep going, you could play. It depends on, you know, what you're going for. I just wanted to show where we've come from. So we had just a little bit of a color in this paper, and now this is where we've gotten the extra um, depth, and oh, you can see the iridescence. Oh, that's cool, look at it, and see it in the reflection. That's neat. So by giving it our glazes and giving it just a simple little stenciled motif, it made it a quick and easy project, and it made it be something you can jazz up, a simple paper, simple little tombstone, and make it into just a really kind of fun Halloween accessory. Okay, I just can't leave well enough alone. I've got my little edges here, and I want to go ahead and just give them that just rough, using the non-black modeling paste, just give them a little bit of stone kind of texture. And then I'll let that dry. That I'll add just totally add to the jazz. I've just tinted it with my base color, and you can paint over the top of this stuff too. Okay, while I'm showing things off, just wanted to share this is the bottle goes all the way from that 29 inch one down to a little thing that can be just a charm on something. And the tombstones come in little, basically hand-sized little dudes that you could, you know, put the boot letters boo on there or something like that. You could really have a lot of fun with these. Okay, we're going to start painting this ginormous bottle. This isn't the most ginormous one. Um, if you're going to paint the really, really big one, then you want to get the, um, I think they're texture, texture, they're oval texture brushes. Um, instead of these big dome brushes. Okay, so what we're going to do first is we're going to get some highlight going on and then we're going to glaze over this bottle at the end. So we're going to establish highs and lows and then um, so I'm using cocoa on the edges. We're using our paper towels. We're going to go through quite a few paper towels for this. I like about dry rubbing is it's just something that is so simple that just anybody could do it. You could, you know, take a stranger in off the street and say, hey, let's do this technique, and they could get it. It's actually quite amazing how much resource material there is for apothecary jars on Pinterest. They had just tons and tons of boards and things. Apparently it's even more popular than I thought it was. Okay, now what I don't want to do because this bottle is so massive <clears throat> is I don't want to have itty bitty little floats around the edges. So bring that color in just a little bit. That's the beauty of using this um, this dry rubbing technique is you can just walk the color across. I'm going to go dirty brush into um, French vanilla and hope that it's not too screaming, but we are going to be glazing um, over the top. So let us see. And now we're going to keep this color in um, to the edges. And I did make sure to sand my bottle because I wanted this to be fairly smooth. I didn't want wood texture in my bottle. Okay. Repeat on the other side. I'm going to 
bring that highlight around the top because that's where the shine would hit. You could change your colors up and you could make a wine bottle out of this. You could make a chalkboard out of the big one. That would be lovely. Make a wine bottle chalkboard, maybe with the label of the chalk part. Okay, so this is making, um, looking just a little bit strange, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna carry on with it. I have a solid plan. I hope it works. If not, we'll start over. So when I want things to fade, I just lessen my pressure and use a brush that has um, tired paint on it. So, okay. Okay, so that looks like a giant mess, but that's okay. Now we'll go on to our black plum color, which I'm hoping is not going to be a very stiff brush. <clears throat> okay, so we we'll want some black plum back there. Make it be like a little bit of stuff shining through from various background areas. It's not very often you get a workout while you're painting. Oops. Spend some time on your paper to on your that's where my label's gonna go anyway. Silly me. So I'm spending a lot of time in this area for not a very good reason. Alright, so we've got to bring some of this out then. Forgot all about the label. Which was the whole idea behind the jar. Definitely have some of this jar showing up down here. Save your um, tired um, little paper towels for another day of painting and it helps you reuse and recycle a little bit. Once they dry out then you can just use them for the dry rubbing. darker. I need to get my label out and see how far it comes out. I'll do that now. Okay, I've got my label cut out. It's going to fit, basically. So I've got a good bit here to play with. deepen that color. Everything that we're doing right now is really almost as if we were doing it in grayscale and wanting um, a kind of a warm grisaille look. And then we're going to glaze over with those really wonderful transparent pigments and change the color of everything. sure that I'm transitioning all the way through on the bottle. Don't like stop before the edge of the label. That would be bad. Okay, I'm going to repeat with soft black. some really super strong stuff. Okay.
Okay, and I think it's time to glaze. Okay, I've got a color mixed and I've done the top right here. So let's see what it looks like when we get um, when we get big. Okay, we're going to use water as our medium. And we're going to mix, and this is going to be a little crazy for some of you, so just um, hold on. We're going to take a pile. You're going to need a like a, just a flat scoop of primary magenta and vermilion. And that's going to get us kind of in our orange family. We need plenty of water. Go in and grab a little bit of yellow to lighten it. A little bit more magenta. If you're looking for something that says magenta, but it's definitely orange. Now we'll tone with our gray. And then a dash of purple. You want plenty of water because we want this as a glaze, not as a base coat, which it's not going to base coat anyway. Okay, and then we'll go on here and plenty of water. You don't want to leave lines and marks and things like that. Big sweeping, plenty of water strokes. Bring it down the front. Got to get it all on there while it's wet. Deepen it up a little bit. Make sure you use shape following lines. Okay, now let's get it dry. Okay, now in the meantime, I've got my label and I've tested with one of my other pieces. I've gone ahead and um, just crumpled it all up. You can go through and sand if you feel like something is just a little too pristine. This is an old, dusty bottle. Been around for years, kind of thing. Okay, so that gives me kind of a worn out kind of look. A couple tears in the corner, that's perfectly fine. And that's what I'm going to do to this. So I'm just going to, ready for it, rumple it up. Use some pressure. It's kind of a cathartic kind of thing to do. Undo it. And I've got this is a bigger piece, so I've got some kind of uncrumpled areas. So this time I'll crumple in from there. Yeah, I got some little rips and tears. It's perfect. Anything that looks a little too new, just sand, too saturated. Okay, so that gives us a nice, nice look. Okay, like the color of the bottle. I'm gonna go in with a few little floats. See how the glaze just kind of brought all those colors together. And you could increase um, some of that. You could, you know, go and float it again or glaze it again. Okay, so we want a nice dark. This is soft black. of stuff hanging on the edge there. And then I think 
Let's go into a little of this glazing but light on this edge. It's a little bit more yellow. That's where you get that beautiful luminescence of these pure pigments. Yeah, I don't think I'll ever paint with the regular acrylics alone again. Pretty amazing stuff. Just a remarkable difference. Okay, get that dry. Okay, I've got the feathers, pardon my dirty, messy table here got my feathers based with um, zinc. I'm going to go along and just shade the edges with a rough kind of float. Okay, just give it a little bit of a shazza. Okay, I think we're going to go in with a little teeny bit more yellow-red. Just knock that yellow back just a little bit. And just right next to that edge. Right next to things that are shiny. The yellow is going to give me just a little bit of that glow. I'm going to take a little bit of texture uh, model, of the modeling paste. Yeah, I'll get it straight, the white modeling paste. I'm going to mix it with cocoa. Okay. And then I'm going to kind of make texture looking. Probably need a little piece of tape. Tape is definitely your friend. So this is stretchy tape and so that will bend however I want it to. So I can just kind of tweak it that line. So I'm going to get it on there and kind of frost it first. I have something to play in. And then I'm going to start looking for some texture and just lifting, almost like when you're doing a lemon meringue pie. And you tap it and it goes, makes little hills. And then just ever so softly flatten the hills. Okay, now I'm going to get my decoupage medium. And I'm going to apply it over the middle. And you can actually apply it over the whole bottle just to um, have evenness of texture and sheen. Get a bit of water. Okay, go back over. A bit of water. water. There we go. It's almost like I had to just get it to its happy place. And now on the back of our being careful not to get it on the front. I'm going to wipe up my mess. And leave some of those um, tears up. Don't glue them all the way down. For more realism. OK, 
Okay, and then we get our little cap. Out to our edge. Okay, smooth out any bleeding out. Okay, now we're going to add one coat. I've got a very wet brush. Don't leave your 4-inch brush in water overnight because you'll crack your handle. Ask me how I learned that. Okay, so I'm going to mix my glue with my water. And then I'm going to go just over the whole ding ding diddly thing. That'll protect my paper from what I'm about to do next. Okay, while I'm waiting for things to dry, I can just give my nonstick mat a little squirt with some water. Use my um, handy scraper, which is very handy. And everything, including the Mod Podge glue, everything will come off of this mat, and then I just wipe it with a paper towel. Okay, I just said the words Mod Podge glue, and that's what 40 years of marketing will do for you. Um, but I want to say something about the difference between Mod Podge and Decoupage. When uh, about mm, maybe five years ago, I was looking for, we started doing stuff with these papers, and I was looking for a product that if I glued down papers, wouldn't lift back off when I had water touching it. And Mod Podge definitely the ones that I tried definitely lifted back off and this was a brand new product at the time and um, Tracy Moreau was like you got to try this because it really works really well so I gave it a shot and it doesn't lift back off and doesn't reactivate with water so there's a big difference between your decoupage mediums um, just Mod Podge has been doing it longer and has the word in my head so um, be aware that they're not all created equally okay so now we've got this done and it's dried and I've got little loose bits here and there and that makes me happy okay um, we're gonna make it look like it belongs to the bottle so we're going to take and we're going to do kind of what we just did in that we're going to mix a couple of things together to get it we got to get to that brown they don't happen to have a brown right now okay so I want to increase the strength of a little bit of antiquing so I've got some purple, some primary magenta, reach across with a wad of, and that's looking just like a lovely plum color, and go into a little bit of black, and not getting brown at all, get into some yellow, <clears throat> okay, well we're getting a lovely gray here, there we are, that's an umber, lots of water, there we go. So when you mix a whole bunch of colors together, you eventually get black or brown. <clears throat> now I want to go in and I want to kind of just float this. So I'm going to control my edges. Too much water. I love that I can go like right over my crow and it's not going to affect it one stinking bit. Get some antiquing here and there. Don't want it to be everywhere. Let's bring this across the bottom nice and strong. I'll give this bottle. <clears throat> it's got allergies super bad right now. Sorry. Just give this antiqued look to this thing and that's going to catch really unevenly which is awesome I'm not floating anymore by the way I'm just kind of glazing it's going to do it's going to catch the cracks and it's going to do all kinds of really neato things okay so we're going to look at our work and we're going to squint and I'm going to bring this down just a little bit almost a little bit glazed 
everywhere. Just that white is just a little bit too clean for me. All right, now we need to get into some, I think, the interference medium. I think, and I'm trying to decide if our crow needs to be blue, purple. Not sure. So what I'm going to do is play. I'm going to lean towards, yeah, I'm going to lean towards green. Okay, I'll just get some kind of iridescence going in his. And need a little bit of help. So what this does, the interference medium, which we talked about earlier, is where it's really dark, it's going to give that green cast of color, so like on the lettering, but it's not going to really affect your background at all. So I can get the whole word, just by glazing right over that area, a little bit of green. And I can take my feathers, which are black, and I can give them a little bit of the green. pulling in to catch the light. Okay, I'm going to go into my bird and I am going to bring in some blue. Look at how that's just not picking up. It's not taking away the um, my color. Just want just an ever so subtle hint. Just so he's not black and white. Tip those words. Okay, take a look. <clears throat> okay, so now our label is definitely more aged than it was before. Here's the before, here's the after. And I think we could go back into our little greens and pick up pick up a little bit. Where are you? Thalo green plus the interference and the um, turquoise. Just a hair of the thalo in that. I want it to show a little bit more. Just a little bit in the background. Maybe this used to be a colored label, but it's faded or something. Pick up just a little bit of the yellow. Fade it out. Okay, now I'm going to take a little bit of asphaltum, and I'm going to glaze my cork. Let it settle into the different areas. And then I'm going to use a flat paper towel and pull it back off the high areas. And now we have like a self-shading cork situation. Okay, I like it. All right, we're about at the shine place. Got a bottle on my computer that I'm looking at. That's what you do when you need to look at something to see where the shines are and all that kind of stuff. You need to get online and Google it, and you'll have all kinds of resources. Okay, we're going to use a little crescent dry rubbing brush, and we're going to sprinkle a little.
shine there. I'm going to repeat with some white. And we've got a little bit of a, kind of a little shine moment going on next to the edge. I've got a big shine moment going on right here. Let me see if I can get it in the right place. So I've got a little bit going right here. Okay. And then lots of rubbing off over here because we're going to have a big... This is like where the light is hitting the front of this bottle. to a bigger brush for that one. Okay, and then we'll give it some white. that out back into our French vanilla. I think I'm almost thinking this can come down around this corner just a little bit. And I'll go into some French vanilla and give just A little bit of a line going down the edge. Go into white. And that's going to be our shiny, shiny, shiny. Okay, and there's our little bottle. And I think our little cork can use just a little bit of extra pop. So I'm going to just brush over the high stuff with a little sizzle of French, um, nope, not French, yeah, French vanilla. And that just gives it a little bit more hay on the cork. All right, to give my bottle a little bit of shine, I'm going to use gloss varnish just on the bottle. Not on that label. nice shiny little bottle. Okay, I've accessorized with a couple of my crow feathers, a little bit of raffia that I've shaved with my scissors, and then a little bit of frayed rope, which I could actually go through and do some more fraying for age and antiquity. And I think that just is the jazziest thing. It would make an awesome wine bottle, awesome um, apothecary jar, whatever use you want, but I think labels decoupage, just too much fun. Okay, for our third and final quick craft, we're going to take our little jewelry bezel and we are going to take the stone out of it, or you could trace it with that, and we're going to take the smallest of our labels for mermaid tears, and we're going to indicate where we would cut, and we'll just use our scissors and cut it out. Now, if you don't want to go to the expense of buying these stones, or you want to make your own um, jewelry out of other things, I've got a good alternative. Okay, this GDO stuff right here, what it does is it makes the cover or the surface of your item look like, it's like that old bar stuff that you used to use in the like 60s and 70s, but this doesn't bubble, which is wonderful. And you can embed things like 
uh, feathers and moss and whatever you want. I've got glitter in this bottom of this. So you just mix a tiny bit of it. You put it in your frame piece or just on the flat wood piece and then level it off. Put it on a nonstick mat or something that um, you can just peel it off later because um, if it goes over its edge, it will be stuck there. But I like that it self-levels if I put glitter or something else in it. But in the meantime, we're going to go ahead and just cut this out. Okay, and then we've got our paper. So we want I want my mermaid to have just a little bit of, let's get you down in there, a little bit of turquoise in her. So I'm going to go with the um, phthalo and yellow and a touch of the blue. Yeah, that's giving me a nice little turquoise color into the blue. I guess you can't see what the heck I'm doing here. So I'm just getting a turquoise. And then I'm going to get my head in the way because I can't see what I'm doing. And I'm going to just give her a little splash of color. And, yep, I've changed the scale of my painting here. So we could have a little bit of that color up top to balance this out. We could rinse and give her hair just a little bit of yellow. These pigments are so strong I'm having a hard time just swishing them out of my paintbrush. Okay, so now she's got just that little bit of yellow going on. And Bob's your uncle. You pop that puppy in there. And you glue in your bezel. And now you have a beautiful, if you add a couple of little accessories, or keys, we've got them on the website, feathers, or a bottle of whatever. You gotta get that glued. Okay, so now you've got a charming necklace that falls apart. I'll do that again. So now you have a charming little necklace that um, you've just added a little tint of colors. You could put some things underneath. Um, it's just a fun little project. You could do it with the kids, um, change it out, that kind of thing. Okay, I've got my necklace here, but I think I'm gonna make my bottle a little bit dusty. So let's get back out here. I've got a little bit of khaki tan in this great big oval texture brush. I'm gonna stipple on a little bit of dust. That. Given that little bit of aged patina. Let's go one more time. Work that paint evenly over the surface of that brush. I've got one spot that has way more than the other. Okay, there's our dusty old bottle. And as just a little bonus, I'm going to do the same exact thing with my um, apothecary jar things. This would be the most darling. You could use little ball jars and you could put, you know, your, your label on it, fill it with candy treats, send it to your grandkids, put a, you know, a, a burlap um, thing on the where the label is. You can go find apothecary jars. I got mine from Hobby Lobby. Um, you know, so you can just put these labels on just anything and because you get so many sizes, um, you can make just like a jillion projects. So I'm just going to do the same exact technique that I did before. And I'm going to use the matte decoupage. It says it adheres to glass, so I'm going to age this. I thought about using the, um, the, the gloss decoupage medium because, um, because I thought that maybe it would, on the glass, the gloss might be a better idea. But um, I'm just going to go ahead and use matte. But you might consider that. 
That was just a thought that I had. So I'm just going to do that to all three, and then I'll show you how I put them on. Okay, and just the same way, we're just going to decide basically where we want our little labels. I put some of this medium on our jar. Put some on the back of our paper. Position on the jar. Okay, and just kind of make it fit up there. There we go. I could drop that down just a little bit too. There we go. Make it nice and even. Straighten them out. Okay, so isn't that just freaking adorable? It's already cute and I haven't even done anything else to it. Okay, so you add just a little bit of raffia, tie a couple keys or charms or embellishments, buttons, whatever you got, and there's your cute little um, goodie jar.